Thank you very much, Pete. Just to let you know that the sounds you were listening to as you came in were, as you can imagine, the, um, the acoustic landscape of um, Asplund Stockholm Library. Every frequency that you heard is at the right pitch. I did do a little bit of fiddling with it to make it sound a bit, a bit more dramatic, but that actually was the sound of the library, a little bit treated. So you can see that even in super quiet spaces, noise is most definitely an issue. So I represent not just myself, but I represent uh, my brothers in audio sense, which are Jason Flanagan and Ian Knowles. Jason and myself are both architects, and Ian Knowles is an acoustician. And we got together principally because when we were designing things, Ian, the acoustician, would say, you can't do that, it'll cause this. Um, he would tell us why it's a standing wave, or there'd be a flutter, or there'd be some sort of weird effect which we shouldn't be having. And being sort of naturally curious architects, we thought, well, actually, what is that? What does it feel like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? How, how, what are we trying to avoid through this design process? And so we, we grouped together to form sort of an art group, for a better word, that to try and actually research what it was that architects are trying to design around when trying to create perfect spaces. So what does it, and it leads us to questions about what do spaces sound like? How do we react to those spaces when we work with them? So we've done a few projects, and we're going to talk about these. This is the Soundforms project that was in the Olympics. And this is the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama in Wales. Now, the lecture, this talk is in two halves, really. The first puts the, physic of sound, the physics of sound in context. And then the second half will introduce some actual built work that shows you how we've dealt with it and what the early part of actually looking at sound, how that has led us to actually start to frame it and sculpt it and create it into an architectural and inhabited experience. So when I'm talking to you now, you're hearing my voice. You're also hearing the room. As I speak, the energy from my vocal cords leaves my mouth and bounces off the walls. Now, I'm mic'd up, which is spoiling the fun a little bit. If I wasn't, I'd have to speak up, and you'd hear a different kind of effect. The room would be colouring everything you're hearing. So the, the walls are bringing my voice to your ears as a sort of almost phenomenological effect. Oh, crikey, there's <laughs> all sorts of effects going on. I guess it's stressing my point, I suppose, that I don't sound like this. When I'm talking at home to my wife, I sound different. When I'm up here, the room is colouring me. Every time you go into a room, it's another site-specific experience because the room colours the sound. So this is a room that doesn't colour sound. This is an anechoic chamber. This room is about the negation of sound, the complete death of sound, atrophy. And the, the room is fully, fully absorbent. Um, it's all made of sponge. And as you can see, that there's actually no floor. It's a tension wire grid that this lady is nervously standing on. And that means that the sound actually won't even reflect off the floor. It'll reflect all the way through it. So it's actually whatever sound you put in this room, the room is not colouring it in any way. It's actually the pure sound of what you're listening to. There's quite a famous story that John Cage, the... Um, composer went into one of these things, expecting to hear pure silence. And he was shocked and horrified when there are all sorts of noises buzzing and popping and fizzing. And he said, what? What's going on? All of these sounds are still here. And the engineer told him that what he was listening to was actually the blood running through his veins, because the room is so complete and so dead. They're very, very rare to get a very, very good one, that one that'll do that. Most of them has, have a noise reduction rating of five or around about. They should have a reduction NR value of zero, and then you'll get some really rather alarming effects. So if we're going to talk about sound, we need to know what sound is. So there's many myths about sound. They think it's moving air, moving this, that, and the other. And it is actually moving energy. Air has no part to play in sound, other than sort of determining frequency which we'll talk about in a minute. But if you look at that red dot at the top, that's actually an air molecule. As the sounder wiggles up and down, i.e. my vocal cords or me hitting that, or a loudspeaker drum, it creates a little bit of energy, a wave of energy that runs across, and it raises, it just puts a pressure wave, that, which is why we measure sound in SPLs, which is sound pressure level. 
So the air isn't moving, but the energy is. It's just like a wave moving a boat up and down on the ocean. But the frequency of those waves actually, de actually determines the frequency of the sound you're hearing. So the faster they are, the higher they are, and the closer together they are, you know, that's the high frequency, and the low frequency is a large wavelength. That's why when you go into super trendy shops with those tiny little speakers and a bass subwoofer, you can't actually detect the bass speaker because the frequency is larger than the width of your head. So you can't actually find it. A high frequency like my voice, now you know I'm coming from roughly over here, despite the room reflection, which you now know about. But you know I'm over here because the wavelength of my voice is actually smaller than the, the distance between your ears. So that's how you know I'm here, and that's how we do echolocation. So to understand sound further, we need to understand how we represent it. It's phenomenally difficult to draw and talk about and do anything about other than listen to it. Max Newhouse, the, uh, the great sound artist, is constantly frustrated about the lack of his ability to be able to articulate sound on a page. So this is not a musical score. This is a um, phonotactograph, I believe, by uh, Antheus Kircher from the 14th century. And this is not actually showing how music w should be played, but is a representation of the experience of what the music is. A music score is an instruction manual, if you will, but this actually starts to talk about time and experience which led Antheus to be able to produce beautiful and rather crazy installations like this, where the actual panoptograph at the bottom there is starting to generate notes, and it's actually starting to become part of the mechanism of creating music. So it's a representation of its sort of manufacture and its experience, but not the same way that a musical score does. A musical score isn't a visual representation. I know we, we look at it to use it, but it doesn't actually represent the experience. So another way of representing sound is the world-famous harmonograph, which is a series of pendulums with, um, with a pencil on one of them. Now, the swaying of the pendulums is analogous to sort of the frequencies of sound waves. And a lot of people like to think that the drawings from these things start to represent some sort of acoustic quality. And they are really, really beautiful drawings. This is a drawing from a harmonograph. And they really are quite exciting. But I, I, I think it's a bit of a misnomer that they're actually a proper, proper acoustic representation. This is a Chladni pattern. And this is a vibrating plate with some powder on it. And as the plate vibrates, all of the powder starts to align itself to certain lines of structural force on the plate itself. Now, these excited scientists for many, many years because they thought, actually, we're looking for the first time at sound itself. And I think, yes, you are in a funny kind of way. You're looking at the relationship between a material and the actual oscillating frequency. You're looking, it, it's an exercise in materiality rather than visualizing the ephemeral quality of sound itself. And it's also a, a, a sort of a cut, a slice through. It's not a three-dimensional representation. But still, it does give rise to an incredible array of patterns. And this gave, um, gave the world uh, the, the art and science of cymatics, which uh, I don't know whether anyone's heard of that, but it's a really, really quite incredible series of visualizations of transsectional cuts through um, sound and materials. I mean, a really good example here is this. Um, this is a, a harpsichord, and they've put some iron filings on the harpsichord and started playing it. And you can see all of the lines of force in the structure of the timber are starting to form these really, really rather beautiful patterns and inscribing lines about how the material is working with the performer. One of my favorite examples of uh, cymatics is a piece by Alvin Lucia, who we're going to hear a little bit more about in a minute. And this is called Queen of the South. And basically, the score for this piece is that all the musicians have to try and keep a pattern on a screen. So you have bass drums with sand on them and all sorts of materials and trumpeters are playing at them and making a hell of a racket. But visually, all of that racket is starting to become represented. It's a really nice piece and a really simple score by an absolute genius. One representation of sound you're probably very familiar with is a spectrograph analysis. 
Now, this is a pure physical cut through what the sound actually is. There's volume, there's amplitude, there's frequency, and all of it's there on a really nice, friendly timeline. They're, they're used by physicists to analyse things and sound, and I actually find them quite exciting and quite beautiful in their own way. But I think we can do a little bit better than that as architects. But one beautiful example of how spectrograph analysis can be really, really integrated and really made something quite special is a piece by an artist, New York artist called Jeff Talman, who had microphones on the bedrock of Manhattan. Columbia University was using them for seismic surveys. And he actually got access to the records of all of these recordings of the bedrock underneath Manhattan. This is what I love about sound art. You get people listening to real rock rather than other rock. <laughs> anyway, so Jeff was listening to rock and, um, and managed to, and was trying to visualize it in spectrograph analysis. And he was getting to the early part of this century in uh, September 9-11 and saw this, which I think is one of the most haunting images. You can see the bedrock drone at the back there of just the earth doing not much. And then, bam, two huge lumps of sound falling. And I think it's, it's a really, really haunting image of that the actual towers are represented again as towers. But here, this is a sort of acoustic after image. It's all rather sad. So this brings me to my living room, naturally, where I've had a go at trying to represent sound. And this is... Um, much of the amusement of my wife, me roaming around my living room with a, a microphone and a light on the end of a stick. Sound is three-dimensional. It's immersive. It, enc it encompasses us all. And it, when, when you have a constant tone, it forms something called standing waves, which we're going to talk about in a minute in more detail. But standing waves are static movements of energy. And so what I was doing was trying to represent where that energy was. Every time I walked through one of the standing waves, the light would light up. And there, with a long exposure, would be represented. So this is a series of standing waves at 680 hertz. Tech fans, take note. And there they are. And you can actually start to see where the pockets of sound actually are. Here's another version of it. So that is just sound. So how do you represent the organization of sound? which is something that we're all very familiar with at the moment. Whereas, I mean, Varese used to say that music was just organized sound. And I, I quite like that idea, because music can be many things now. So this is a musical score. As I said, it differs from the panoptograph, because whilst this is visual, it, you can't actually see the passage of time in it, other than knowing it's a 4-4. Four, four. It's just a simple instruction to a player. And this is a piece by Bach. Uh, this is the musical offering, which was written for a uh, King Ludwig if, uh, in, when Bach was around. And this is quite an exciting piece, because what Bach does is he actually, he's got a cyclical thing going. And the way that the cyclical notes starting to act with each other, he's creating what modern science now calls a shepherd tone. And a shepherd tone is a constantly rising tone. It's an auditory illusion, as it were. And this constantly rising tone appears in this score. And this score's got a few musical jokes in it. It's called the Raisicare in Latin, which means seek and you shall find. And in the background is this constantly rising tone. But actually in the foreground, the, the actual main soloists are asked to improvise over the top. So Bach is says, keeping things open. It becomes a much more open exercise in control. But it's interesting that this has been visually represented in this Escher drawing where the actual movement of the water that seems to be constantly going up but actually isn't going up at all is totally analogous to Bach's musical offering. And if you were to hear it, which I'm not going to play it to you now, sadly, if you were to hear it, it does have this very frustrating sense of tension that it's always rising, always rising, and then it's still always rising. And it's all rather bizarre. This is a fantastic piece. This is the Fontana mix, or the score for the Fontana mix by John Cage. Now, John Cage wasn't really into being very prescriptive about an entire piece of music. He was interested in the sort of systemic organization of how people would approach his music. 
So this is a piece where he wanted it not so every single time this piece of music was played, it would never, this, never sound the same. So how do you actually release a set of instructions to do that and yet keep the originality alive? It's a little bit like Bach was doing, saying improvise here. But John Cage has been much more in control of this. And I think that if you're aware of Solowitz's drawings, this is exactly the same sort of process-driven, systemic approach, where a series of instructions are given to a, a series of musicians, and they are then free to interpolate those in any way they want to. So this is for sort of 16 musicians and 16 turntables. So John Cage was completely in control of the creative process, but actually had devolved autonomy to each musician which has got a, a very strong line in sort of cybernetic and systems theory, which I'm sure my students will tell you I bore them sensors with all day. This is a, a further step up in the world of the representation of organized sound. This is a score by Stockhausen. Now, this is a score for a set space. This is a score for, I believe it's called Spiral. My German isn't good enough to actually translate it, but this was written for the Osaka Expo in uh, 1976 where the actual building had been built. And this score was written to go into the building. So there was a series of nodes. In fact, I should show you here. There's Stockhausen looking dapper in his brown suit. And there's this whole Buckminster Fuller geodesic dome overhead. And each node of the dome had a little speaker mounted on it. So Stockhausen was actually writing music to go with the actual dome itself. So it's sort of very, very site-specific piece of music writing. This is, all oh right, a phone. I was hoping someone's phone would go off, because now we're in a controlled, crowdsourced environment of phones. We should see this as an immersive environment, like crowdsourcing. If your phone goes off, don't worry about it. I actually think that we could actually create something here by this sort of landscape, a topology of mates saying, where are you? Let's go to the pub. <laughs> so this score is by Cornelius Cardew, and it's called Treaties. It has baffled musicians for the last 40 years. I think they're some of the most staggeringly powerful drawings I've seen. They are, hey, they are musical scores, and they, um, you have to interpret these as you wish. There's about 120 sheets of this, and musicians often play you know, sheet 16 to 24. I mean, I don't think anyone's done the whole lot, but they are some really, really exquisite drawings with tension and balance, and it's a really, really artistic process. This score I really like. This is a trombone piece by an artist called Phil Niblock, uh, which is a really, really dense drone, really. With, and these, these notations are instructions, just written instructions to musicians to play in certain frequencies and certain pitches that respond to the room. We're getting, it's a little bit like Stockhausen, where it is about responding to the room, but it's also a little bit more of a cage as well, where you're free to interpret it within different sort of parameters. So this is, this is starting to get almost a line-by-line -line instruction. It's not visual in any way, it's just a series of numbers. But the actual piece itself, which is a durational piece, as you sit in this room, you encounter all this strange phenomena of standing waves, and you can walk into it and out of it. And Phil Niblock actually likes people walking around in his performances, because they get a, real, an, a really rich, nuanced basis of what the piece is actually about. So to get back to architecture again, and the influence that sound has on architecture, we have to go back to Pythagoras who was one of the first people to actually really look into the sort of notions of uh, proportion in harmony. He noticed that notes that pleased him and notes that pleased p people had a certain relationship when visualized on a musical scale, and certainly in, in stringed instruments where it's very, very visual. And here he is on a zither with a little harmonic sequence of, um, of nodes that are weighting the strings. So, so as you can see, I don't know if anyone plays instruments or, or knows about this, but if you have an open string going all the way, the octave of that string, like the double note, is actually exactly halfway between it. And then the subsequent notes, the fourth and the fifth, have a very special relationship as they go up and down the fretboard. I mean, it's, it's, if I had a guitar here, I'd visualize it for you beautifully, but I can't play for toffee. But trust me, it's all about harmonics and the proportions of notes on the string and on the fretboard, which is exactly the same as the golden section. 
It's exactly the same proportional basis. So when Pythagoras and, and the early philosophers discovered this, they really thought they were onto something. They really believed there was harmony in the universe, that all of the universe was singing the same song. And visually and physically, that we, everything was in the right place. Here's the, obviously the Fibonacci sequence, which is exactly the same relationship. I'm not going to go on about pi for ages, so don't worry. But the important thing was how these people felt that this homogeny of relationships was starting to develop. And this is the amazingly named um, monochord by Robert Flood. And this was, a, this was a, a sort of an illustration, a representation of how the har harmony was going all the way through the universe. This is one string, and it's going down through the universe, through the clouds. It's the sun at the center. It's very Copernican. And who's tuning this monochord but God himself? So there was this amazing feeling that everything in the, all the planets were aligned and everything was wonderful. Of course, it's all nonsense. It, it, it doesn't really work like that. To have a beautifully proportioned space is very nice, but if anyone's ever read um, Rudolf Wittkauer's Architecture in the Age of Humanism, he really, really debunks the nature of harmonic proportion. I mean, visually, it's quite interesting, but actually, it's not really, the, so there's not much science behind it. But what is interesting about harmonic proportion that I quite enjoy, that, that the score is starting to become a blueprint for architecture. And here we have a section through Chartres Cathedral. And each of the nodes on the section are corresponding to another harmonic position on a, on a sort of a guitar's fretboard, for want of a better word. I think these guys were probably getting excited about lute fretboards at the time and the Jimi Hendrix lute people at the time. But this is Chartres Cathedral, so the actual the music was starting to inform the inside of the space. And here it is here, which is a beautifully proportioned facade. But it's deeply intrinsic to music and how you listen. And what's really beautiful about the relationship between music and architecture is what actually came first. Are cathedrals built around plain song, or was plain song actually built to fill an orchestra? And I think, I think the relationship between architectural technology and music that was played in it has had a really reciprocal relationship as things have gone on. As technology has increased, such as as the cathedral builders were creating these vast spaces, more reverberant, more depth, more, more reflective surfaces and whatnot, old drumming and things like that would have been lost. It would have sounded like soup in these places. So the things that worked were plain song. Long held tones ah, that went on and on and on. And so there's this, there's this beautiful reciprocal relationship between architecture and the authorship of music. I mean, I, I think that's probably the subject of another lecture at the moment, the relationship between those two things. And uh, one day I'll give it. So getting back to the score as blueprint again, this is a fantastic piece and it represents the first piece of music I'm going to play you uh, by an architect, well, an engineer called Xenakis. Now this is um, a score, uh, a glissandi, if you will. And he, as, as when he, he was an engineer for, for Le Corbusier, as I'm sure you all know, and he was writing music in the evenings while being an architect engineer in, as a day job. And he was starting to write music, and the writing process of the music was starting to influence the way he was looking at his architecture and the way he developed his buildings. And so he was trying to develop a system of, of you know, pre-stressed concrete lines for the Phillips Pavilion. So as he was developing this sort of architectural system, that was feeding into the music process. And, I'm going to, and this is actually a score, and I'm going to play it to you. It's quite spooky.
Oh, yeah. So, so, thank you very much to Will, Pete, and Teo, by the way, who provided a kick in sound system for tonight. I think it really needs it. So I'm very thrilled. That's the, I, that's the longest I've let that one play, actually, because I was getting right on it then. Obviously, you can see it's, um, it's of its time. This is called Metastasis and was designed, as I said, for the, for the Philips Pavilion. And it was based around a hyperbolic paraboloid. And here's one here. And Luca Buzzi was very interested in these forms at the time. So the development of these forms in concrete was, was in sequence, analogous to the writing of the music. And this is a very interesting piece of music itself because it was written for this a performance space. And the, the theme of the Philips Pavilion, here's Luca Buzier and Verez and the client. And the theme of the building was it was going to be a, a stomach. And you were, I don't know whether you can see it, in the thick, heavy line at the bottom there. But the thick, heavy line is actually the uh, Luca Bouzier's drawing of a stomach. And as people went into this through the esophageal mouth at the top, you were then digested in this Verez soundscape and then exited, for want of another word, through the duodenal fire exit. I don't know whether building control used exactly those kind of terminology. but So uh, th there was a beautiful Verez piece, which I won't play you in there at a moment, which is super intense and tapes and all sorts of things. Again, that's subject for another thing. But this whole building was all about sound and all about the sort of the production of sound, the representation of sound. And what I really like is the way that the actual score for the piece actually becomes the blueprint, just like Chartres Cathedral although with different sounding things. Here it is here. I'm sure you're all going, oh, well, I know that one. So what this brings us to is the nature of surface. Sound is nothing without a surface to bounce off. As you saw with the anechoic chamber, if it's a dead surface, if there's no surface, there's no reflections. So if you look at these surface hit surfaces here, these are sort of the differing surfaces which most acousticians and architects play with. The first one is just a flat surface, like a wall. And that gives us what we call specular reflections, a perfect slap back of the sound. Now, we have specular reflections in this room here. All of the surfaces are quite flat, they're quite sharp, and that's why my, my voice now is sounding a little bit harsh and probably a little reedy, and possibly a little annoying. The other surfaces show different effects. The convex surface distributes the sound. The wiggly one at the bottom Dis diffuses the sound, it breaks it up. As the sound bounces off all those crenellations, it starts to actually lose its energy. And so you'll st we'll, we'll get on to concert hall acoustics later on. You'll start to see how these surfaces, as they're arrayed and deployed in a concert hall, start to actually affect the quality of the acoustic you're hearing. The interesting one is the one in the middle, which is the concave surface. Now that, as you can see, all of the sa all of the the arrows which represent the sound are all pointing to one place, they're all going back to where it is. This is an acoustic phenomenon called focusing. And it's been used to great effect in the Dungeness sound mirrors, which are incredible pieces of architecture and have been used in the poster to advertise this talk. But what they were, for those of you who don't know, is that uh, they are a very primitive uh, radar for pre-World War I. And as sound of bombers coming over the English Channel would obviously get to the land before the bombers did, this huge reflective surface would focus all of the sound from the bombers and focus it to one spot, probably about there. And they'd have a chap standing there who'd be listening to this. And I've, I've been told that they used to use deaf people because they were a little bit more aware of the acoustic environment than actually fully sighted. Blind, thank you. <laughs> it's one or the other. <laughs> they used blind people because they were focused, more focused. And um, <laughs> it's been a long day. Anyway, so the sound would reflect to this person, and they would pick up that sound and be able to say, oh, shit, there's bombers coming in two minutes or something like that. It wasn't very sort of early warning. But they became sort of really, these really, really totemic structures that really, really worked. I think they've got rid of that blind chap in that one and put a microphone in its place, which is quite nice. But what that brings us to is, and uh, sometimes we get those kind of surfaces in normal architecture. This is the uh, interior of the Amaryllis Fleming Hall at the Royal College of Music. 
Uh, I'm sorry about the quality of the slide, but I don't know whether you can see that the whole barrel vaulted roof there is a perfect curve. It's another reflective surface. And what this is doing is creating, it's actually sort of a beautiful design, but actually creating acoustic problems because that's all focusing down onto the platform. So when you're playing in this hall, in this space, you're getting sort of strange effects, strange things are happening. Here's some analysis of the Amaryllis Fleming Hall. I know it's quite complicated, but the, the three slides at the far end are showing if you have a sound source, which is the light blue blob, that sound source is projecting upwards, creating a very, very uneven distribution of the purple blob, which is representing sound as it hits your ears. So what you need to do is actually break up that curved surface with some panels. And as you can see, with, a, with the quite a nice array here of about 16, you get a really, really even spread of sound. Like this. Here's one we did earlier. This is, this is um, Arabs and Flanagan Lawrence that was, I think this was installed about uh, six weeks ago. And this is how we sort of solve the problem of the Amaryllis Fleming, by putting all these acoustic panels in that actually break up the arc of the soffit. So you get a really nice spread at the bottom. They're very happy with it, I'm pleased to say. But it's difficult to do something like that and keep it looking pretty in the theme of the hall. And I kind of think it works. You can still see the curve, you can still see the drum, you can still feel the drum, but you don't hear the drum, <laughs> which is a bad bit. So another piece of music I'm going to play you is a, a version of site specificity in writing of music. We've talked about the blueprint as a score, but how about the actual site as a score? So this is an album, obviously, by Brian Eno, and he wrote this piece of music as an architect would approach a site. He actually developed a brief for himself to actually write this piece. Now, this was developed for a Chicago O'Hare Airport, in the 70s, and the airport, com they commissioned him to write a piece that would run inside the airport for a long time. So he had a brief, just like architects do. And the brief was, you know, it had to be at a suitable volume, it's got to be soft enough that you can hear the announcements over the top. It can't be, it can't be at the same frequency as a human voice, because then you can't hear other people. So it's got to be really, really not non-intrusive. Uh, the volume's got to be right for announcements. And it's got to be able to play endlessly without too much variation. You know, it can't be boring, but it can't be too sharp or juddery. But it's also got to, and this is a bit I really like, it's got to reflect what you're doing. Because you're going to go and fly. You're going to do something beautiful. This piece has to reflect the sort of acoustic, that, that quality. That. But also, you might die. So the piece <laughs> had had to bring that into effect as well. So we're going to hear this. actually listen to that all night. It's beautiful. And I really love the fact that that design brief really influenced the trajectory and the narrative arc of the music, which I think is exquisitely beautiful. And I encourage you to go and get a copy if you can. So this brings us to some of our audio work. I'm going to play you some music now, well, not some music, but some sound art from a project we called Bowwater House. Now, Bowwater House is on the site of One Hyde Park, uh, the Rogers building. Um, and this was the build, Bowwater House was the building that was there before the Rogers Resi, and I'm, I'm sure we all know how expensive they are and whatnot. But this is the building that was there before, and it almost follows the same diagram. It's uh, looking out over the park, but also looking onto one of the busiest junctions in London. It has a bridge with traffic running underneath it, and it looked pretty horrible. But what was 
amazing about this building. It was getting all this noise from all of these different parts, from the traffic, from the road, from everywhere, from planes going overhead. It had, it had a real problem in what we call structural born sound. Now, if you listen, if you put your ear to any wall, you'll actually start to hear the building. The buildings have a certain acoustic signature. If they are too bad, then they become really, really bad for us as humans. They produce funny frequencies that make us feel ill, and you get something called sick, bu sick building syndrome. So structural born noise is actually quite an important consideration. That's why you have, sometimes have apartment blocks near railways. They have to put rubber dampers in them and things like that. This building had no such attenuation and uh, sounded pretty nasty. So we wanted to hear what this building would sound like by making a window recording. Not recording out of the window, but recording what the window was listening to. The window, the glass screen, actually forms an oscillating surface. It's so thin, it actually picks up quite a lot. It's like a speaker diaphragm. So we did two recordings here. One of them was the, just an air recording of nearby a window. So I'll play you that. Okay, sounds like Streatham on a Wednesday. It's probably boring. That is what London sounds like as a rule. So this is what the window's listening to. Damn right. It's on Spotify. Rate it. Tweet your mates. <laughs> I, find that, I find that really, really haunting. This building's about to be demolished, and that's its song, as it were, the song of a dying building. Those, we don't know what they are. All the acoustics are baffled. No one knows what, how that sound gets in there. The air recording was taken the minute before that last recording was taken. The drone probably can be explained by the oscillation of the window moving up and down. But still, it's this really, really powerful recording. And it's actually quite spooky. Another really powerful recording about rooms is by Alvin Lucier and his I Am Sitting in a Room, which is another process-driven piece of music. And Alvin did a really, really simple thing. He sat in a room and recorded his own voice. He recorded that and played it back. <laughs> Now, as you know from what I said earlier, the room has its own noise, has its own colouring. So as Alvin went through this loop, the room coloured each recording again and again and again. So I'm going to play you a few sections of Alvin talking to himself, and there he is with a microphone. And we'll hear a snippet of a series of fragments through this single recording of the iteration of this process. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice and I am going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves so that any semblance of my speech with perhaps the exception of rhythm, is destroyed. OK, so that actually goes on for about six minutes. So each, frank, each bit is about six minutes. So this is the after about 10 minutes. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice and I am going to play it back into the room again and again. So as you can hear, the recording quality is dying. It's sounding awful. Most people would have rejected that and said, no, that's awful. 
So let's hear it about 20 minutes into the process. I mean, you'd pay a lot of money to get a synthesizer to do that. And that's just one man, one room, one tape recorder. It really is, a, it's one of the most, probably one of the most important pieces of sound art in the 20th century, in the way that that really has got everyone thinking about the role of space in what we're listening to. In fact, it's so easily done. When I was Googling for images on the internet for this, I actually found a family doing it in a church. So, I mean, bring your mates. Another interpretation of the I Am Sitting in a Room was done by a, a, a Danish artist called Jakob Kierkegaard, which, who updated the idea and actually started to play the sound of silence back into a room. Now, this is a piece of his called Four Rooms, where he went to Chernobyl and started to record the silence of the spaces in, in Chernobyl and then overlay that back on itself. Now, the loop went on for a little bit longer than Alvin Lucius did, but he got these incredible, scary, terrifying drones. So once again, that's just the layering of silence. It's amazing how powerful it is, especially when accompanied with the image of actually this dying room, a room that sort of was once inhabited and now isn't and will never be. So I promise you I'll tell you about standing waves, and now is that time. When a sound happens in a room, it bounces off all of the walls. In a rhomboid or trapezoid room, as shown there, it's starting to have different effects, and it's bouncing off different surfaces. In a rectangular room, or square, or more proportional room, it starts to form exactly like the image on the, on the left there. Uh, it starts to form these patterns. The one on the right, if it's a suspended, a held tone, it'll start to form its own pockets that you can't really predict where they're going to go unless you have really extreme modeling software. But what's happening is that the energy is coming out of the energy source, like a, a loudspeaker, hitting a wall and bouncing back and hitting itself. And because it's constant, it's actually amplifying itself. And so it's causing sort of um, constructive interference, really, by forming a wave, a, a body of energy that isn't moving. And here's a demonstration of two waves. They hit each other, and they get amplified, but all around them is silence, so they are frozen. And this is what you start to get. This is another trans, trans section through a, a series of waves. And they showed different sound sources at different frequencies in different sized rooms. But they're starting to form these strange patterns, these strange effects. This is what acousticians try not to do in recording studios. If you go in a recording studio, you'll find that they're all funny shapes. They're all rhomboids, trapezoids. They're not rectangular. There's no surfaces which are parallel to each other, because that causes this phenomena. And basically, you could be mixing your mix down or whatever and sitting in a standing wave and actually not getting the right, right balance of sound. So it's really important when you're actually designing spaces for listening that you try and vo avoid this effect. So naturally, we wanted to actually create one and work out what is it like to actually stand in a standing wave. So we managed to persuade a gallery owner in uh, Hoxton that this would be a really cracking wheeze to do over a weekend. And uh, we got a load of, we got a space. And this was uh, the curator space, which I think is long gone now, but was quite a cool gallery w way back when. 
and it was a funny looking space but it had enough sort of odd qualities to be able to lend itself to its own signature acoustic signature so what we did we worked out what the wavelength of the room was as you remember earlier when I told you that a low frequency has a wavelength it has a length the lowest note on a cello is about 2.7 meters so if a room is let's say three meters what is that corresponding frequency so we worked out what the frequencies of this room were in terms of wavelength and we put a logarithmic scale on those to create a, a tone that was a, co a chord, let's say, that was specific to that gallery space. No other space in the world would have this tone. So we put some speakers into the room at different corners and let the system go. And what we found, we had two standing waves in exactly this position here. And you could actually start to inhabit these. You could walk around them. You knew they were there. You felt them there. You felt your shirt start to wobble. Remember the light drawing I did with the, with the LED on the light? Well, that was actually recording exactly the same phenomena. So it's a really strange effect that you're actually walking into the room and there's nothing there, yet you're feeling something there. There's a presence. Once again, there's a sort of a phenomenology of self as you walk through it. Naturally, it's bloody difficult to represent. And here's a picture of a speaker that I can assure you is hurtling out a tone at the right frequency. And I won't play it to you because it is actually quite dull. It, it, it's a thing that you have to inhabit to really experience it. What we were lucky enough to do is that excited enough people in London that they let us loose in the turbine hall to play there for an evening. And the, the turbine hall still had the great... Um, generators at either end of it, the step-down transformers. Now, I don't know if everyone remembers going to the Tate when it first opened, but there was a hum, a 100 hertz hum that was always in the Tate. It was totally prevalent. So we got to play with this hum and start to try and accentuate the standing waves and work out what the perceived landscape was as you walked through the, the turbine hall. So we put speakers there and played a 100 hertz tone back into the room. Now, that 100 hertz tone created these pockets of sound. As you walk through them, you could actually trace them. We did, so we did some mapping exercises by starting to work out where the standing waves were. And they formed this really, really intense grid of tone that you could walk into or out of. But what amused us that we're only used to hearing a tangential cut at ear level. We don't know what's going on above us or below us. So we were walking through this slice that only happened to us. And I really don't know what's going on above or below our ears. We only know what's here. So there's some more research there in how to actually we understand the full room dynamic. And this is what we got a modeler just to play around with it and uh, show us what it would have looked like. But the amazing thing was is we, we really cranked it up. Being, being a bunch of lads with a huge load of speakers, we really got to play with this thing turned this tone right the way up and created this skull-crushing drone. And as you walked into one of these pockets, your shirt started wobbling, trousers flapping. It was like being standing in the front row of a really good rock gig. Insert your favorite band there. But it really was quite incredible. And as we were doing this, we were playing around with it, one of the step-down transformers changed frequency. I think it probably was half-time in a football match. It could have been East Enders had finished. But what happened was that the, the tone dipped. And as the tone dipped, it created a, a, a really strange phenomenon called, called deconstructive and a constructive interference. And the room started vibrating. It started pulsing. I'm going to explain to you what that is in a minute. <coughs> But it was terrifying, this whole boom, this thud. And you could hear things rattling in the ceiling. It was really, really strange, strange feeling. So we liked that so much, we thought, let's do another one of those. You know, let's, let's recreate the sound of that interference. So we based it on the myth of echo and narcissus. It was, we, it was a commission for, funnily enough, a, 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 an art installation around the theme of love. And we thought, how on earth do you do a, <laughs> a sound art piece on love? And we noticed that in Echo and Narcissus, we had the love that wasn't there, really, between Echo or Narcissus. But there also was the sound in the Echo was doomed to repeat the last words of everything she ever heard. And Narcissus was doomed just to be self-absorbed. So we thought we can play around with these ideas. And if we have two tones, just like we learned in the Turbine Hall, two tones, one that dipped 
and one that was static, then we'd create this effect, this um, oscillation effect. So, and this is a sort of a visual, this is a ripple pool where you can see what's going on. It's almost the moiré effect of having two sound sources that are interfering with each other and creating these sort of strange patterns. And the science behind it, I'll be quick on this, is if you have a normal frequency, let's say this is 100 hertz, and then you add another higher frequency, let's say this is 112 hertz, you can see that the blue line is going out of sync with the yellow line. And so when it's in sync, it's going to be louder, like we've learned from standing waves. When it's out of sync, it's going to be nullified. There's going to be no sound there at all. So the green line is the resultant thing you'll actually hear, which is the, the throb. And if you've ever sat on an aeroplane that's about to take off or a cross-channel ferry and heard a vroom, 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 that is that effect, loud and soft and quiet. So we got our room. This was in a, um, for the Sonic Arts Network Expo a few years ago. We had a room in an art gallery in Brighton. And we had our Narcissus, which was a man-made oscillating object that was going to vary in frequency. And we had Echo, that was a synthetic frequency that wasn't going to vary in frequency. We wanted something that was going to change. We wanted something to create these standing waves. Now, what we wanted to do, we wanted the idea that if we had a perfect standing wave, like a pure sine wave, a pure tone, if you have a, a mechanical object that makes a similar tone, because it's man-made, it's a bit of a failing, it's going to go up and down, you're going to get that, that, that oscillation, that frequency shift, and that's what we were looking for. So we, were, we had to put this object in this silver box here, once again, Narcissus, and we didn't know what the object was, and here it was, the ultimate object of of sort of self-thinking, <laughs> self and ironically enough, is man-made and it actually um, is a bit wonky and doesn't work very well. It sound, it, it, this oscillates at um, about 100 hertz, which was perfect. <laughs> and um, and if, it's quite funny, I had to test drive a few of these and got thrown out of a sex shop for <laughs> listening to vibrators. So here we are installing it, and there we go. But here we get to the... So the money shot, as it were, with the... This is what it sounded like. So you've got a mechanical frequency and a digital frequency. Now listen to the difference. That is a sound system, isn't it? That's how it should be heard. When we did it in that gallery, it was, it was so thumpingly loud. It really was a, a shirt-wobbling moment. And actually, it became so physical that people were leaving the gallery, actually sort of giggling. There's a sort of sense of euphoria. Because when sound is really, really loud, what happens is it starts to mess with your balance system. And um, you actually get a sense of euphoria because you have that sort of sense of falling, which is why sort of people, people at rock gigs love loud volumes but maybe it's not very good for hearing though. Another piece we did on a similar effect was uh, this uh, Samadhi, Samudya Manthan, which is Khmer for the churning of the ocean of milk, which was a piece commissioned for a dairy. And it comes from the old uh, Hindu myth about the churning of the ocean of milk and gods and monkeys and snakes and all sorts of things, which I won't explain here. But it seemed an appropriate myth to be trying to recreate in a dairy. And there it was there. And we thought the best vessel to demonstrate this effect is, is the humble milk churn. If you have a vessel and put the appropriate tone in it, you can excite its resonant frequency. The uh, Greeks used to do this and all sorts of other um, the, the old temple builders used to sometimes put jars in the walls of temples to create Helmholtz resonance, which, which would actually bolster any orator who was speaking in that temple. 
And so this is an old trick that we tried to sort of recreate with milk churns. By having a milk churn, working out what its sort of its wavelength would be, and then putting a, a tone, a scrolling sine wave that would oscillate between 1,000 hertz and 100 hertz, that would start to go through the resonant frequency of the milk churn. When that happens, the milk churn starts to get excited and starts to get gain in amplitude. It starts to self-oscillate. You can capture that by putting a microphone in it. And if you have a cluster of them, you can have a choir of milk churns. <laughs> and here they are. <laughs> our beautiful choir of milk churns. And yes, there we are setting it up. And I'll just play you this briefly. But you can start to hear the, the scrolling wave and you can start to hear things gaining in amplitude. I did a little bit of playing with it because it was actually quite boring. So we, we started to just gild it a little bit just to help it along a bit. three days that I did, and it, it grows and grows and grows. It's a very subtle piece. But I, I, I do quite like it. I quite like the theory there. So that's what we do as sound artists and as sort of acousticians. But how can that then translate into actually the production of space and the production of spaces for listening to music, the negation of these things? So I'm going to show you three projects now. Uh, a small one, a medium one, and a large one. It shows you how all of that theory can be synthesized into the practice of the production of space. And the first one is um, a project which is still on site at the moment. Uh, this is a stage by the sea in Littlehampton. And here's an old bandstand in Littlehampton. And they wanted to, I think this is long gone, this bandstand. They wanted to replace it with something new and innovative. And so they asked us, that we won this in an open competition, to develop a bandstand. Here's the site, and it's on this very, very deeply green, they call it the green sward. So our building had to sit in this context, as well as being a bandstand. So it had to negate the sound of the sea, it had to be focused, it had to be condensed, and it had to actually reflect the amplification and needs for about 15 musicians. We wanted it to be embedded into the landscape, a bit like a sort of an old old hill fort or one of these with berm, you know, a really integrated piece of architecture. Uh, I don't know whether you know the ha-ha, you know, something that's invisible and visible at the same time. This is, a, this is a piece of Littlehampton, this is a path through the dunes. So there's already some site context about how to actually start to address the physicality of what we were going to do by using forms from nature, the beach, the sea, the sand, waves, and seashells. The seashells are a very important thing. It's a recurring motif, really, in the production of spaces for listening, uh, in that it's traditionally held to the ear in the vain hope that you'll hear the sea. So this is a diagram of what we, what we proposed, which was two, two spaces. The top one is actually the concert hall space, which is projecting outwards with the audience looking in. And the other space is a, is a shelter, which can also double as a temporary and smaller performance space. So you've got two back-to-back -to -back, back -to -back performance spaces and shelters based on the integrated form of the shell, the pebble, a wave, and a landform. Obviously, this gave rise to 100 million prototypes that had to be looked at and then discarded, also rigorously acoustically tested. And this is the engineering for it. We wanted to be, it had a very, very tight budget. And it's quite funny, everyone thinks that when an architect has all the budget in the world, it makes it so much easier. And funnily enough, when you have a really tight budget, it makes things much, much easier. You really are focused. You have to be much more condensed. You have to be much more brave and much more honest about what you're doing. So we wanted to do a single skin concrete shell. 
Now, concrete's important acoustically because of the density of the concrete. It reflects the sound back very well and actually, if used and appropriately, can create some really interesting surfaces that actually can help back up the band that's playing in the shell. So here's some acoustic analysis of one of our landforms that we did. As you can start to see, it's starting to look like a stage now. And it's just gently rising out like a seashell, projecting sound towards the masses. And you're quite lucky. This is the first time I've ever shown anyone this in an open lecture before. So you're the first. And this is what we hope it'll look like. As you can see, it's very intimate. It's very small. It's very gentle. It's very integrated. And it's quite subtle, really, in the, la in the, the way that it works in the landscape. And this is currently on site now, and I believe this is, this is it two weeks ago. So I'm not joking, we are actually doing this. This skin is 100 millimetres thick. You know, it's really, really tiny, and it's over four and a half metres high. So tell your engineer that next time when he says, oh, no, I need at least 330 mil, and stretch back everywhere. And this is the part of the form work going up. I'm actually going on site tomorrow, and I'm really looking forward to it to see what it looks like now. But... Um, it's actually quite exciting. So that's a very, very small space. A larger and more important one is the sound form shell, which uh, rose to prominence in the Olympic Park last year. And this was done by ourselves as BL BFLS, as we were then, Arab Acoustics and the ESG Group, who are a uh, contractor and developer of temporary structures. They did a lot of the infrastructure for the Olympic Park as well. And these fine people, Architect Landrell, Fine Line, and the Total Solutions Group, who helped with the engineering and materiality of what we were doing. But a quick story about how it worked was based on the idea of a temporary structure, a moving pavilion, something that could, that could change, be folded down, packed up, and then reassembled somewhere else. This also comes from the idea of democracy. This is the Theatre dell'arte in Italy, where after sort of huge economic recessions in the 18th century, um, Italians were actually taking theatre out to people on the back of trucks or wagons, horse-drawn carts, and passing around a hat to actually generate money for the performers. And so they actually had a, they've actually got a history of taking performance outside of the cities where all the elite are to actually the more open spaces areas where, where people who can't necessarily go and see high performances still get a great performance. So you really like the idea of portability and democracy. And of course, you have to go back to some of the great engineers of the 60s about how mechanical production eases these conditions and how we can actually use um, these mechanical techniques and industrial techniques to create this deployable architecture. So it's all based around a concert hall. This is one we did earlier, which I'll talk about later. But a concert hall is enclosed. All of the surfaces in it are there to reflect and get channel the noise to your ears at the right ratio, at the right amplitude, at the right frequency. In an external performance, you don't get that. Now, I'm sure you've all seen performances like this at Glastonbury and all sorts of other places. This is acoustically rubbish. It doesn't do anything. All it does, it keeps the rain off the performers. And if performance, performers can't hear each other, you're not getting a good performance back. In a concert hall, a performer is getting the reflection off the room and they're responding to that room. They're feeding back onto that room. They're also feeding back off you listening to them. So in a concert hall, you get a good performance principally because of the way the room is relating to the performer. In an outside space, you get none of that acoustic backup. It all disappears out. Now, in some theatres, they have these special acoustic canopies which they fly in and they stop sound flying up the fly tower and getting lost. So this is, a, this is a, a product that's on the market at the moment for the, by Black Cats. And this actually is flown in a theater, enabling you to have a sort of a semi-concert hall experience in a theater. No one's done it for the outside until now. So what the important bit is, alongside all of the walls and everything, is the roof. The roof, funnily enough, is the, the, the actual, these are called um, reflector arrays. And as sound comes off the platform, it hits this reflector array and comes back on the audience. That's what no one's, that's the innovation that no one's been able to crack yet. So what we did, we worked out a series of, a series of repertoires. 
Console design is always about repertoire. You know, remember I was talking earlier about the reciprocal relationship between architectural technology and the music that's going to be played in it. Well, if you want a chamber hall, you know, you actually start with chamber music. What is the acoustic that chamber music requires? So you have each, each little orchestra, each group has its own specific space that it likes to play in, that it sounds good in, that's perfect for it. So we developed a series of shells that fitted a series of repertoires, as it were. And uh, we actually patented these shells, these ra the ratios between these shells, like a recipe, like the recipe for Coke. So this shell is totally patented now. And we formed these three typologies, these three generators. Now here, here you can see some acoustic modeling of an acoustic tent with, uh, well, no, with no acoustics, a you know, typical Glastonbury tent. Imagine that the yellow bit in the middle of this image, we're looking at a plan. You're all architects, so you know what that is. We're looking at a plan, a sound has happened on that plan, and it's squirted out in 360 degrees. And here's an amazing animation of that. There's the stage. That pur those purple balls are sound. They're going out, and the length of the purple, you can see there's no control in their spread everywhere. If you can actually control it and channel it with some hard surfaces, then you start to get much more control over the sound. You're actually being, you're in control of it, it's not in control of you. So here's another image, lovely animation. Look at the control on that. Those bo all that sound's been channeled exactly where we want it to go, to the performers and to the audience. The lingering balls inside the shell are reverberant. So they're showing that there's still a bit of feedback into the shell, which is helping the musicians along as they work. And we developed a peak. And the peak, as I said, is a reflector array that is so fundamental to the propagation of sound. As you can see, that when you have the shell and its peak, the sound is exactly controlled and exactly where we want it to be. And here's an animation of one of our first prototypes. Splat. So this is the sort of real acoustic modeling about how, how we were seeking to understand the, the role of sound and the role of the audience and performer. So these are some more sort of uh, sound modeling developments. And you can see as the shell got bigger and bigger, the control got better. So this is the um, sort of spatial brief, the hierarchy for it, with a simple canopy, the performance base, two wings, and a back of house area. We wanted to keep it as simple as possible. And this is one of our early prototype models. Now, we had to make a lot of these models so we could go fundraising with it and try and get the funds for it. This is a project without a client. No one was paying for this. We are a series of architects and a musician, a guy called Mr. Mark Stevenson. And we developed this project together and fundraised for it together. I think it's a really sort of new way of procuring buildings. I've never heard it done like that before. But it just goes to show that you can actually, if you really want something built and really mean it, then you can actually do it, even if you haven't got a brass farthing. Although, sadly, everyone loved these models so much, they all got nicked. I mean, everyone kept them. Bastards. So this is some of our earlier illustrations of what it could look like in Somerset House. And there's a sort of more developed brief as the one that went into uh, production. And there are three families, the small, the medium, the large, all looking rather beautiful and shell-like. You see that recurring shell always comes back. So this is a plan of it, a cut-through plan, where you can see the wings, you can see the platform, and you can see the back of house area. And here's a section which really importantly shows the acoustic panels. You can see the little gridded red line, which shows that some of the panels are angling out, towards the audience, and some of the panels, the sawtooth panels, are angling back to the performers. So the performers are getting an acoustic as well as the audience. So this is the assembly. First you have to put in a base structure and fill it with ballast, normally sand or water or 40 tons of cement in the Olympics one. And then you have some uh, secondary structure. And then a goalpost structure. Now, this goalpost structure was quite important because this was actually starting to help all of the other uh, overarches come into place. It wasn't used structurally in the actual object itself, but it was fundamental to the assembly of the structure. So it sort of uh, becomes vestigial after it's all been made. So we have a series of ribs. All of these ribs are all linked to one key pin joint at the bottom. 
So the actual shell itself is going up just like a pram lid. And you put these things on, and that's the full structure, the pram lid that goes together. One of the most complex bit, the one that gave us a real headache, parametric fans, is the double curved element that goes around the edge, the front lip. That is had to be made of a series of single curved entities that when put together became a very, very complex double curved element. Now, because the fabric was going to be stretched over this lip, it meant that the force of the fabric as it went round the full line would actually start have different pressure on different areas of the, of the line itself. So it, be, it was really complex. We had to understand where that structure was going, where that force was going. My God, it was a headache. So here we have the stage going in. Then the acoustic panels, which look like teeth. A fabric outer skin and a fabric inner skin. The fabric inner skin is acoustically transparent, which is an important quality. It means that sound can go through it and come out of it again and hit some rather less engineered acoustic panels on the inside. And now we have the skin. Now the skin is a semi-inflatable skin. That is to say it's two layers of rubber that are inflated, and that keeps it, keeps its round form. As you know, with most inflatable structures, they just look like bouncy, cancel, bouncy castles. We wanted this one to look like a fully independent structure with the right form, the right shell-like quality. We didn't want it to have that bouncy castle aesthetic. Here's the pin joint, which is a beautiful piece of engineering. I think this is the only steel on the project. Everything else is made of aluminium. And here it is being assembled in a, in a yard in the East End. Uh, my dad thought it would just knock your hat off. So it's quite a sharp. It said it looks like it's coming to get you. And so here it is being assembled. We had to do a full prototype, and this is the prototype. We used this to, um, to demonstrate it and test it to make sure it all worked. And here's that beautiful internal skin, uh, the tr acoustically transparent stuff. This is a product called Joel Elastic, and it's really, really stretchy. It's like Lycra and you can make these amazing shapes with it. And funnily enough, it's, even though it's white, in daylight it goes purple. It's got this strange purple quality about it. So here it is, have it, having its teeth put in. Um, this is in the Docklands. Um, we had a, a test run in the Docklands with the London Philharmonic. And uh, they, they came along, and Nicola Benedetti was there as well. And we, we, would, we gave it a test under the flight path of London City Airport. So every now and then there's a thumping jet would go along and all the orchestra started giggling because they didn't believe that, that we were actually serious. And they were all amazed. They'd all done outdoor performances before, but none of them had ever worked. And this one, they said, God, it actually works. And people were pacing around in front of it, test driving it. Does it work? Can you hear it? Can you hear it? And it was. It was a natural acoustic that was going out to the audience. And it really was quite sort of an epiphany. And luckily enough, uh, the good men from LOCOG were there. And they saw it, and they liked it, and they wanted it to be the bandstand for the Olympic Park. And there it is. This, this picture was taken from the BBC website. I didn't hire a helicopter to go and take it. So there's the sound form in the park. And I don't know if anyone saw it. I wouldn't be surprised if a few of you have. But it was in the park for the full duration of the main Olympics and the Paralympics and hosted um, quite a few, hundreds of musicians. It had to host probably about sort of uh, 20 performances a day by different people, differing size of choirs, differing size of people. And it really nestled in its environment really, really nicely. We were very, very pleased with it, how it worked. And um, one of the funny things that, that, that we found out, you know, a real sort of moment where we knew it was working, because when you are on tour, there's lots of people moving amplifiers around and banging things around and generally moving things and getting into trouble. And, and when they do, they start sort of using colourful language. And they were all doing this on the stage. And, uh, and we saw a sign in the back of the stage for all of the people who were working there. And it said this. Which, which I think is a real affirmation, the you know, proof of concept. It's interesting that it took foul mouth roadies to, to do that. So finally, we get to our last project, which is the we've gone from the micro to the medium to now a, a proper concert hall. And this is the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama in Wales. Um, and this is in Cardiff. 
And this was a, a very, very complex project. They wanted a concert hall and a theatre, backup spaces, ancillary spaces, and it had to fit in a very, very tight site. Um, it was in Butte Park, which is a Grade 1 listed park, which we couldn't muck about with too much. It was, it was a real challenge working out how we were going to get all of the brief items actually onto the site and properly. So that was the available space we had for all of the new accommodation we were going to put in. And that is the old building, which is one of the most ghastly examples of 60s office architecture I've seen. And they really wanted that masked if they could. Even the planners said, please mask it. <laughs> so these are the three core performance spaces that we had to fit in. Now, we designed this in a way which I think we've sort of taken on for future projects, which is designing from the inside out and the outside in. By designing from the inside out, as you know, when I was talking about the role of repertoire in designing a space, they wanted a chamber hall. So we actually started with almost a piece of music, almost a single musician. What would a chamber orchestra sound like in an empty space? And what would we need to add? What walls, what surfaces would we need to add to make that chamber orchestra sound beautiful? So that's designing from the inside out. You start off with almost you know, a, chamber, chamber, a string quartet on a platform in the middle of the woods and then start to frame it using our acoustic knowledge. Same with the courtyard theatre. A courtyard theatre still has its own sort of uh, acoustic requirements where, where they have to talk up. They have to, um, it's, a, it's a very high space to represent other theatres in the UK. It's a training college, so all of these people are going to be moved onto other, other places to do their performing. So it's a learning place. So we, did, we started, as I said, with the chamber hall, and these are sort of early acoustic analysis of what it needed to be. How, how the sound needed to bounce off the walls in the right time and the right place. And this is what we ended up with. Um, all of these surfaces have a role to play in the propagation of sound. The, these uh, sort of scallop-like surfaces with the wobbly edges, that's about diffusing the sound, so it breaks up the early energy. So all of the energy is diffused and it hits your ears in a very gentle way. If you're sitting at the front, you just get a blast of direct energy. So next time you're in a concert hall, try and sit further at the back. Let the energy from the performers dissolve as it washes over the people in the front rows who are too silly to get the right acoustic seats, and then all of the sound will come to you in the right place. There are, what you can't see here is um, some uh, black absorption, which they can deploy if they've got brass bands in there, which are phenomenally noisy. And also we've got the reflector array at the above, as you remember that from sound forms, that that's how you can bounce sound back, a secondary reflection back onto the audience. So we did some anal reverberation analysis for this to work out how it would work. And as you can see, some of those spaces are starting to, to form themselves. Once again, uh, the, the, the green balls are deployed to tell us exactly how things are working. This is all done from a piece of software called Odeon. And uh, as we just said, there it is. And this is uh, the opening night, which, um, which went really, really well. Actually, no, sorry, this is acoustic testing and they all loved it, and I've heard some great reports from other acousticians who are very jealous about it. So once again, all of these walls, these, the acoustician Ian Knowles was desperate that these, those, that light feature had a, had a glass surface on it so it would bounce sound back to the people on the edge row. As I said, everything is acoustically considered. There's nothing here that isn't part of the acoustic dialogue. So here's the exterior. The, the timber of the outside of the drum reflects the timber on the inside of the drum. Timber is very important acoustically because of the density of the timber. 18 mil ply is, um, is the right weight to carry the right amount of bass for that repertoire. So we had a timber feel, and also it was in the woods. This was nudging into the woods. So we wanted it ref to reflect a little bit of the sight back into the way it worked. This is its tail end. This is the front entrance, and this is the foyer. So you can see the articulation of the hall within the shell of the building, which most uh, architects, when they design concert halls, they just look like huge, big lumps. And we wanted it, you, you to be able to read the concert hall from the outside. 
and I think I'll finish there. Thank you very much. <laughs>